Over My Dead Body is the title of a story by Ezekiel Kralin, the latest in the uh, saga. Um, it begins where Ezekiel Kralin wrote email correspondence March 24th to the 27th. Subject, Friday night meetup, loverly, date March 24th. Friday night, good visit, though he tried to wheedle another $100 out of me way ahead of his next payday. I did not oblige him. Seeing as Deke said he was stopping by for just a few minutes and it wasn't that cold outside, I offered to bring down a sheet of cardboard and nothing else. So I did that. I called Lucky over, who was curled up on his master's lumpy backpack. His sister was already comfy on Deke's lap. He got up, walked over to me, sniffed about the cardboard as if something were missing, and then returned to the backpack. Ah, Lucky wants a blanket or no deal, I chuckled, and then proceeded to go back upstairs and fetch the sleeping bag I keep handy just for the pup's visits. But right there in the lobby was that middle-aged couple who moved in on the third floor about a year ago and are notorious dipsomaniacs. Some days they barely make it up or down the stairs, like they're moving about on a ship as the waves roll and cuss each other out as they gingerly maneuver the wobbly staircase, though I've never seen them get physical. Get off of me, you fucking piece of shit, she'd blurt. Ah, you're a stupid old bitch, he'd retort. Struggling to keep their balance, one would hold on to the other, who would lean against the wall or clutch onto the round wooden railing to keep from collapsing under their partner's weight, but this night took the cake. The old fellow was sprawled upon the lobby floor, eyeglasses aslant, and his lady crouched over him. He mumbled while looking up at the high ceiling. I don't deserve this. I've fallen and I can't get up. When are they going to fix the fucking elevator? I was just standing there because his legs blocked my way to the stairs, feet skewed upon the first step and poking up like short black pylons. The woman then looked up at me and queried, Can you help us? No, I can't, I replied matter-of-factly, then proceeded to cautiously step over his lanky form and onto the stairs, one step above his own protruding feet. It was a tight squeeze to keep from stomping on his ankle and possibly falling down myself, but I did not, and made haste to disappear from their world and enter my hovel, I did not want to encounter the two sots again so soon, so I waited several minutes inside till I heard them stumble their way onto my level and up the next flight of stairs. As soon as I laid the comforter down, Lucky rose from the backpack and began to rearrange and fluff up the sleeping bag to his satisfaction, using his sharp little teeth and chunky paws accompanied by muted growls of defiance against the lifeless bedding. He always makes quite a show of it, and takes his sweet time to get it all just so, moving around in circles before plunking himself down at last. So that's that, Watson, a pleasantly uneventful meet-up other than my encounter with those two foolish drunk residents. Deke only hanged out about a half hour before departing. He was surprisingly mellow, though maybe I shouldn't use the word surprising anymore, as such friendly visits are becoming more the norm than the exception these days. Thank Glob for that tiny cabin village and the kind people who manage it. I'm sure it ain't always easy. Re Friday night meet up, loverly, date March 25th morning. Watson wrote, Ha! I love the cameo appearance of your glamorous Scott and Zelda neighbors. I replied, such episodes in my life make me wonder if I'm a character in somebody else's story. The entire scene was perfectly scripted, and I only had one line to speak, as did each of the other two. I had to look up your reference in a Scott and Zelda search to learn of F. Scott Fitzgerald's rocky marriage with his wife, which ended in alcoholism, mental illness, and untimely death. In Hotel California North, there are no beautiful, just the damned. I am definitely living on the wrong side of paradise. Our nights are not so tender here. Watson wrote, Indeed, that picture of the pups and Deke is a good one. I replied, One picture is worth 999 words. The little scene out there imparts a peaceful aura. The hounds are such troopers, they never complain. Oh, about Lucky's paws. A few days ago... When he was holding the little fellow in his arms, I said, How much I love his chunky paws. He replied, Those are basset hound paws. Upon which I immediately realized, Of course, why didn't I see that all along? Just how mixed is their lineage? And why didn't Deke ever mention that before? Did maybe someone tell him recently? Flaco doesn't have those kind of paws, yet they're clearly brother and sister. There's some other breed in that mix, besides dachshund and basset. Well, what do you know? I just searched for a small pit bull and found ones that look 
very much one that looks very much like Lucky minus the dachshund traits, a little more searching, and I learned they're just called brindle pit bulls, now not a different breed, but a variety therein. Subject, Saturday's report, date March 25th, afternoon. Saturday afternoon, Deke dropped by just to visit and have me put different music on his chip. I brought some cardboard and a blanket down for the dogs, capered with them upon the plush folds. I like that their master's showing more affection towards both and has been hugging them in his arms frequently. I've never seen him do that till recent weeks. Though when Lucky was sitting on his lap and I was rubbing Flacco's belly, he said something which repulsed me and ran a shiver up down my spine. But just before... He did. He frowned and waved a dismissive hand in Flacco's direction as she laid there on her back, gazing up at me with fondness. Stop doing that, he commanded, meaning my scritching her little tummy. He spoke those words in a tone of disgust, as if my loving actions were somehow perverted. He used to do that a lot, try to make me feel ashamed for hugging, scritching, or petting the hounds a power trip on his part, as well as a flush of jealousy over how much those mutts love me. But since he dropped that nasty game months ago, I was dismayed he played that card on me again after all that time. Ah, but Flacco loves her belly rubs, I replied, while continuing to scritch her soft little underside. No way was I going to give him any satisfaction for such a vulgar implication. He did not press the issue, but less than a minute later pointed at Flacco, and declared, one day there's going to be a little pup sucking on each of those nipples. And that is what sent shivers running through my spine. You can imagine, Watts, that how badly I yearned to choke him to death with my bare hands upon hearing those unkind words. The only reason, I mean the only reason, he said that, was to get my goat. So I wisely chose to ignore him and continue scritching Flacco's sweet little tummy for there would only be his vitriolic opposition to anything I could say, such as, Flacco's a darling little dog. Why on earth would you ever want to put her life at risk for your own selfish schemes? What a bitter scorpion sting that will pierce my heart forever in spite of an otherwise amicable visit I now regret biting my tongue and can only hope my silence was sufficient to convey the message over my dead body. What the hell? I don't understand any of this. What's he so mad about? Huh. Subject, March 19th update. Date, March 27th. That was a Sunday. He was a bit of a pest. Started screaming right off the bat when I stepped out to say hi to the doggies and pet them. You're in the way, he hollered with a fury out of nowhere. Told him, no, I'm not. You need to calm down, walk around my feet. You can do it. I believe in you. Get out of my fucking way. Sorry, that's just not going to happen. I'm not going to move because I'm not in your way, I calmly replied while caressing the hounds. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. That's not going to happen either, Deke. Stop acting so goofy, please, was my tame reply to his stormy vociferation. There is no reason for your anger. He then stepped away, stood by the bus stop for a few moments, and returned after exorcising his pointless angst into the dark ether. He had a new smartphone for me to put music on, so I went upstairs to begin the process, which transfer would take 40 minutes or so to fill the 15 spare gigabytes on the main chip. A short while later, I stepped outside again to feed the mutts and met one of Deke's old friends. They used to hang out together on the streets years ago. At least that's what he told me after introducing himself as Jim. Seriously, I said as we shook hands, how could you ever put up with the monkey? He's crazier than a mad hatter. Upon hearing that, Teek's shoulders shook in slight paroxysms as he sat by the pups. Nigger rigging, as he calls it, a pair of sneakers with some toothpaste, a black marker, and a small clean rag, all of which I gave him earlier. Jim has a tall frame, a tad on the burly side, and appears to be Deke's age, 43, a handsome fucker with close-cropped auburn hair and silver-gray eyes. Oh, my God, were I twenty years younger, I'd be in his pants and down his throat before you could finish saying Hassenpfeffer. Heck, were I just ten years younger. But I digress. To be continued. Wow.
Okay. 